Our panelists are ready, and I'm pleased to introduce uh, uh, Arun Kapoor from SJF Ventures. Um, SJF is a venture capital partnership uh, with investments focusing on resource efficiency, sustainability, and tech-enhanced services sectors. Uh, Jonathan Eng from Ashoka uh, currently serves as the global legal, legal director and the first ever legal counsel at Ashoka Innovators for Public and International NGO founded in 1980, uh, which now has more than $40 million in annual revenue. Uh, Sarah Williams uh, is the co-founder and director of Propel Capital, which is a philanthropic and impact investing fund. Uh, and our moderator is uh, my colleague here at Brooklyn Law School, Dana breckman Reeser, who is the vice dean and professor of law and specializes in teaching courses in nonprofit law, social enterprise, and corporations, uh, reflecting, again, the interaction among uh, the various sectors. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dana. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, and advanced thank you to our, our panelists. Um, we're very happy to have all three of them today. We, uh, we uh, had expected to have uh, Rashid Galdanti from the uh, Social Entrepreneurs Fund, who unfortunately due to a family emergency couldn't be here today. Um, but we're, we have a really nice um, group representing different types of organizations that are involved with our topic, which is funding social enterprises. And we, we chose that title for our panel to reflect the idea that um, we're talking as is apropos after Michael Schlein's opening talk about <laughs> doing social good not just through a traditional uh, charitable model, although certainly there are many valuable uses for that model, and I still spend a lot of my time researching and working with and advising uh, folks using that traditional nonprofit model, so I don't by any means mean to dismirch it, dismirch it but to open up the discussion to uh, include this idea of social enterprises entities that are using business models, for-profit models, and business methods to achieve some kind of social mission or social good in their own communities or in the broader society. And all of our panelists um, are engaged with individuals and entities that are trying to do just that and are particularly involved with how to fund those, uh, those very big aspirations. Uh, so I've asked each of our panelists to speak for about 10 minutes or so about their organizations with whom they've been involved and their experiences funding uh, social enterprises kind of broadly defined <coughs> uh, as I just did, thinking about um, trying to give you an introduction to the kinds of funding tools, particularly innovative or unusual funding tools that they have experience with and what are the advantages and disadvantages of using these kinds of funding strategies? Um, so we'll hear first from uh, Arun Kapoor, and then we'll move on in alphabetical order. Great, thanks for having me here. Um, is this on? Yes. Uh, just to get a sense of who's in the audience, maybe uh, if you could raise your hand if you have been an entrepreneur or are an entrepreneur now, aspiring entrepreneur, okay. All right, nonprofits. Foundations, okay, advisors, consultants, lawyers, I'm assuming a lot, yeah, yeah, okay, and I know those are not mutually exclusive. Um, all right, well, thank you for having me, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I can give you some background on SJF. Um, our, we are a return maximizing impact fund, so we are focused on companies that are scaling rapidly, that can generate a venture return, which I can uh, define as generally venture capital looking for maybe a blended average of a, a four times return on money. Uh, some funds are aiming for more, some less, but generally that, uh, and re generating that return while addressing an environmental or social challenge. So our group, our partnership started back in 99, so been around 15, 16 years or so. We are in our third fund. 
um, and we try to find uh, companies that have a product and technology that has already been sold, that already has customers, tires have been kicked, uh, and now it's, it's more about adding fuel to the fire and scaling up the business. So we, um, we have a, a traditional, in many ways, a traditional venture model uh, of trying to find very strong teams with very strong product market fit uh, and looking to make a very strong uh, financial return. Um, the, the difference is that we are focused, all of our partners are focused in specific areas that we think are, um, that have large opportunities where disruptive business models and companies can solve those environmental or social challenges and also scale and make a good financial return. So um, some of my partners focus in the clean tech area, energy efficiency, reuse, recycling. Another colleague is uh, spending a lot of time in the health and wellness space. And for the last you know, 12 to 18 months, I've been ramping up and spent almost 100% of my time in the education space. So some companies there that we've been involved with, um, most recently invested in a company called Raise. It's a uh, marketplace that on the one hot side you have post-secondary institutions, on the other side you have uh, students in eighth through 12th grade. And the traditional pathway of students applying to colleges is they, you know, they sort of think about it in junior year and they apply <coughs> to maybe seven or 10 colleges senior year and then they get in and they, they get told what sort of financial aid they're gonna get from those colleges. So what this company has done is it works with these post-secondary institutions, it disaggregates how merit-based aid and will be moving into needs-based aid is allocated. So maybe some of you knew this, know this, I didn't, but it's actually a science, not an art, in how merit-based aid is given. So an A in AP Bio is worth $1,000 for Texas A&M, it's worth $2,000 to UCLA, it's worth $750 for, UC, uh, for, for Haverford. And so they work with all these colleges, they got 70 partners now, and they disaggregate it onto their platform. So a student can go on uh, 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 in eighth grade and start logging curricular, extracurricular accomplishments, Eagle Scout, um, volunteer, perfect attendance, you know, A in, in geometry. And they'll start seeing the money, the, the merit-based aid they will get if and when they apply to that college. So I think it's a cool model. I think it's a really, really innovative model. It's one of those things where I spoke to this guy about a year and a half, two years ago. I was like, I want to stay in touch with you because I think that's very, very neat and very disruptive. Um, and the colleges like it, right, because, uh, and they're the ones who are paying. The colleges like it because they want to be able to accomplish a mission of finding students that meet their objectives, of building out a new architecture program, of building out their sciences program. And right now, they only get to speak with those individuals come senior year. So they want to be able to talk to those individuals as early as possible, really, to get to know them, to figure out, message with them, to have a conversation. And obviously, it's great for the students because it gives positive signaling for their hard work, their honored efforts in eighth grade. It's like, well, geez, this, this actually paid off. All right. So I can see that there's also a pathway to affordability for these universities. And I think it also exposes students to um, a broader range of universities than they might otherwise be, right? You apply to 10, but maybe that 11th actually would have given you a full ride. You had no idea that it was even out there. So that's sort of one example of an innovative model that, that I thought was intriguing. We invested in it. And another one I'll, I'll, I'll mention briefly, a company called Work America. And it's, um, it's a marketplace, but it's uh, on this, not, not in the transition space between K-12 and higher ed, but higher ed and workforce. And it works primarily with community colleges and technical schools on the one side. And uh, employers of low-income, uh, blue-collar jobs, uh, I think they started in trucking, but they're doing welding and HVAC. And what they do, and I, I, this was something else that was a revelation to me as well, that there's a dearth of uh, qualified labor in those areas. I didn't know that. So they will, uh, they're, they're primarily in the, the southeast right now, but they will work with a trucking company and say, look, you don't have enough skilled labor. Uh, if certain individuals come through these community colleges, these technical schools, and they meet certain requirements, will you guarantee them a job for $30,000, $50,000, $40,000, dollars whatever it is? And they say, sure, of course, we need these jobs. So then they go back to those community colleges and those technical schools, and they say, we can guarantee students that come through your program jobs where they will be gainfully employed after they come through. So the community colleges love it because they will market to these students, and the students love it because they say, should I spend this money going to college? You know, maybe, maybe not, because I don't know what's on the other end, but if you guarantee that pathway to income, uh, um, I think that's sort of a different dialogue. So that's sort of a model that I think is a white space between these transition areas um, that I think people are coming up with some very innovative ideas. Uh, 
what else in education? I think applying data analytics. Uh, we invest in another company that applies data analytics in um, post-secondary institutions. Dropout rates incredibly high. I think it's something like 40 40 percent that start post-secondary institutions don't graduate. Uh, roughly, it's a big problem, right? And they spend thousands of dollars in those first, or second, third years, and then they're just sort of saddled with debt. Um, so this company uses uh, data analytics of these back-end systems, puts it into its sort of machine learning algorithms, and can tell you, and advisors and teachers and administrators, that this student, John or Jane, uh, is at a higher likelihood of dropping out, and you should take corrective action uh, with these students. So it, the advisor can step in and say, you know, what's going on, talk to us, you know, wh what support can we provide you, and ideally kind of see them through the pathway and increase graduation rates. So, so, and I, I've seen companies doing the K-12 space. Those are some uh, companies that I've found that we've been doing some interesting stuff. Uh, so that's a bit of on SJF. That's some of the more innovative companies I've seen of late. Maybe I'll leave it there. When you do find a company like that, how do you, how do you structure the investment? Right, right, sorry. Um, so we are, um, we're sort of a plain vanilla venture structure. Um, we are doing Series A, Series B uh, equity financings um, the company may have raised some seed capital from friends and family. Those are typically convertible notes. Um, your, your lawyers, maybe you're familiar with this, but um, it's a note structure typically that before we come in and then we will fund and we will price some sort of equity or price per share and we will fund the company. We'll take probably somewhere between five and 20% equity stake in the company. We'll typically take a board role or a board observer role and try to work with that company over the course of three, four, five, six, seven years to um, help scale it and help it grow and then find uh, an opportunity to have a strategic, acquire the business um, and embed whatever it's built into its, its uh, infrastructure or you know, maybe take it public. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so Ashoka is a large NGO uh, founded back in 1980. And before I kind of get into what we do at Ashoka, what I do there, let me maybe take a step back and, and kind of paint a broader picture as to the, the context for not only this conference, but perhaps where Ashoka plays. And I think it's about the whole concept of social innovation, social enterprise, um, what that's done is, an, is essentially kind of challenge us to kind of rethink about the different sectors in society and in, in regards to addressing social problems and challenging the status quo with each one and saying what more can we do. Um, so for example, um, as the keynote speaker said before, um, the world's problems are increasingly complex and global in nature and no one sector can address them alone, uh, nonprofits, business, philanthropy, government, and so forth. So the question then, what social enterprise and social entrepreneurship perhaps more broadly does, is challenge that notion to say, well, all right, so what is wrong with the status quo with each of these different sectors, and what more can we do to partner amongst the sectors um, to address these social problems together? And I think uh, the second panel on social impact bonds is gonna be a very uh, tangible um, example of how that comes together to bring government, philanthropy, private investment and nonprofit together. Um, where Ashoka kind of plays in that space as a nonprofit, as a global nonprofit, what we help to do is essentially identify early stage social entrepreneurs around the world who are um, trying to, by and large, forming nonprofits to address some of the world's most in, um, complex social problems. That includes economic development, um, community uh, development, environmental issues, human rights, and, and a whole litany of, of different areas. And we don't focus on the organization, we focus on investing in the individual. And what we provide are um, stipend payments, so kind of early seed stage funding, so to speak, but personal stipend payments to these men and women with these ideas so that they can focus full time on implementing their, uh, their ideas. We're also legal structure agnostic. If you ask a lot of social entrepreneurs you know, are you a for-profit or a non-profit? They say yes. Um, really what their focus is, is on social impact. And I think this whole space has really challenged us to kind of rethink as attorneys in particular, um, what the different roles for non-profit and for-profit um, can play in helping to achieve uh, better social impact. And so uh, what we also do 
um, because we have 3,000 fellows across 70 different countries, in this case, size can be an advantage because what we do, we don't focus on any particular one area. We focus, again, on the individuals with the ideas. And because we have one of the largest uh, fellowship programs in, in the world, we're able to see where the next trends are in social innovation, um, where there's a critical mass of different fellows focusing on a particular social issue. You know, why now? What are they trying to do? How are they trying to accomplish that? And most recently, what we found is this emphasis on trying to teach empathy as an applied skill, particularly here in the United States in elementary school. And we'll create different programs around these critical mass areas to kind of accelerate and see what more can we do so that these individual social entrepreneurs aren't stuck just trying to work on these um, solutions on their own, but bring them all together and then try to figure out best practices. So various programs that we've developed include social finance, empathy, um, Ashoka U, which focuses on universities, and then our Ashoka Changemakers program, which basically runs online social innovation competitions uh, to, to sort through and, and attract different ideas from around the world to address various social issues. Um, so it's not focused on our fellows indirect, uh, directly, but more just uh, the general public. So that gives you kind of a broader framework for what we do um, as an organization. Some of the specific challenges facing our fellows, I think this is interesting because they by and large start off, if you think about it from a pipeline perspective, um, and you look at on, on the one end, the startup social entrepreneurs, the organizations like Ashoka, Echoing Green, Skull Foundation, Schwab, and so forth, focusing on helping to uh, launch some of these individual social entrepreneurs then they kind of go on and form organizations that perhaps attract other kinds of capital, uh, become more uh, growth stage, mis mature stage. Um, and then you can almost look at SJF Ventures coming in at kind of the more mature stage to fund businesses that are ready to, that are already proven, but, but need to scale further, that also create good social and environmental return. Now, the thing is though, it's not necessarily that that's the goal for our social entrepreneurs. I don't think the goal is necessarily to reach you know, four-time return for investors. It's just a different approach, and depending on the idea or the organization, sometimes return is available, but, but other times financial return may not be um, uh, sufficient so, or appropriate, in fact. So one example would be, um, when we talk about social enterprise, the way I view it is there's two components primarily. One is that your primary purpose is a social purpose. Um, and perhaps you can include environmental in that as well. Legal form is agnostic. It's not about whether you're a non innovative nonprofit or a socially responsible for-profit. Um, legal form has nothing to do with it. It's about a primary social purpose. Secondarily, you're trying to apply what people often say are business methods. And what I think we mean by uh, organizations with primary social purposes applying so-called business methods you can, very, you can break it down into at least three components. One is this emphasis on sustainable financing, and so trying to wean yourself off from just philanthropy only, where you're just you know, spending all your time and resources chasing grants and trying to come up with finding uh, how do we sell goods and services directly, or help <coughs> organizations or governments save costs so that we can come up with our own form of sustainable financing. Second would be an emphasis on measurable results, um, it's no secret that the government and nonprofits in general tend to not uh, do as good of a job measuring results. And it's not an easy task, of course, but um, more should be done in terms of trying to identify what are we trying to accomplish, what does social impact look like, and particularly not just outputs, but the outcomes. How can we quantify some of the outcomes um, and, and emphasizing more on measuring uh, impact? Um, just like businesses do with financial uh, returns, that's easy to, to measure. So then the emphasis on measuring social returns is, is kind of a second component to that. And then th the third component to business methods, I would say, for social enterprise is the idea of scale. And so we talk about scale, but tr typically we confuse scale only in the for-profit context, meaning bigger is better, scale your organization. In the social enterprise context, that may be the case, but it doesn't have to be. It could be scaling your program or scaling your idea separate from your organization. And I think a lot of the social enterprises wanting to make a social impact understand that context is key and that their organization may not be appropriate to actually run 
various programs around the country or around the world. And so what they try to do is open source their ideas in some way so that other organizations can adopt their ideas. One example of this includes one of our Shoka fellows out of Brazil. Her name's Dr. Vera Cordeiro. And her idea was to focus on why, uh, the, the problem was why do children from various uh, Brazilian families living in favelas constantly return back to the hospital for treatment about the same issues. And that created obviously recurring costs for the hospital, recurring costs for the government. And so she found out that the intervention wasn't just treating the, the, the sick patients and then sending them home. The issue was more holistic counseling, holistic treatment for the family life so that they were also, uh, when the students or when the children returned back to their family, um, the, the, the parents themselves were being um, providing counseling or job placement support or some other kinds of treatment so that the, there's, a, there's a healthier family lifestyle that they have and then it showed a, a, a direct reduction of return back into the hospitals. And so she was able to prove that her model on more thoughtful intervention uh, helped to save hospitals and then the government money. And then what happened then is other, other uh, regions in Brazil adopted her approach and then they applied that. She didn't focus on scaling her organization per se, but really kind of sharing her ideas so that that would scale. So I think that aspect of scale is important to kind of analyze and put into context for social enterprise. And then lastly, I would say, um, what's relevant for this particular forum and for those of you who are law students, which probably, I don't know, I think I all left. <laughs> um, but those of, you, those of you who are law students, and, and then the law professors certainly, I think um, something that Professor Bracken uh, Reeser uh, certainly is a leader in is, is traditionally social enterprise, social finance has been in the domain of business schools, and then now it's becoming part uh, of law school curricula, and I think that needs to be developed a lot more. We're seeing, uh, and the reason why this matters is not only with the new legal forms that, that certainly are in play, the Benefit Corporation, Social Purpose Corporation, L3C, and then the B Corp certification, and then certainly also tandem structures with nonprofits and for-profits. That all is di directly law related, but we're seeing also a trend in um, large firms starting to focus more on shared value with their clients. And what that means is that their clients, their institutional clients, are also applying a shared value lens to their business approaches. So they want to know what's good for society can also be good for our bottom line. And so they're not treating, uh, businesses are not treating um, their, their social programs like CSR anymore. They're actually trying to bake it into their, their traditional business streams. And so that's, that, that's important for law firms because then if they train their attorneys to also look through business through a shared value lens, then you're aligning your attorneys with your clients, and then you're also able to bring that back to your own firms and, and kind of re-envision what pro bono can look like. Because right now, pro bono is stuck in a CSR model where it's kind of put off to the side, and law firms do that because it's a good thing, sure, but you can also do without that and not affect your bottom line. How can we integrate pro bono into law firms so that it actually affects your bottom line both positively and negatively? Um, that, to me, I think is a, is, is a far more sophisticated and lasting sustainable model for actually integrating social impact into um, an organization such as a law firm. And then lastly, the um, uh, social enterprise and social entrepreneurship in general is challenging the way that traditional law is being practiced. And so we're starting to see areas such as nonprofit law, securities, general corporate, intellectual property, and finance all being uh, all evolving according to social enterprise. And so uh, typically law students and attorneys who would not want to get involved in nonprofit work are starting to find themselves having to understand issues related to unrelated business income tax. Or corporate attorneys are starting to try to understand, all right, what is, um, uh, or nonprofit attorneys, I should say, are starting to then get involved in traditional business law because they're trying to figure out what are these new legal forms and how can that apply my clients who are focused on social impact and, and so forth. So I think this is very relevant, very timely, not only for um, the, the space for nonprofits and social enterprise, but then for law schools too. Thank you.
just have a couple of slides, so I'll use the fancy machinery. So um, thanks for having me, and um, I'm glad to be here. Two of my favorite things are social good and Brooklyn, so I'm happy to be talking about it. If you just had pizza and fair trade chocolate in there, then I'd be <laughs> totally happy. Um, so I advise foundations and individual donors on their giving, and I also direct a philanthropic and impact investing fund that, that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so I have a few examples, maybe more, and I'm sorry that Rashid isn't here. We, we're also investors in the Social Entrepreneurs Fund that he helps run, and um, they're doing really exciting things. But I kind of thought he would talk about some of that, and I talk more on the nonprofit side, so um, I'll fill in maybe some of his answers. So um, I have this little slide up here because I wanted to convey that um, when I first started in philanthropy, now quite a long time ago, there was more this old paradigm that you'd take your, make your money someplace and then take your big bag someplace else and give it away totally separately. And obviously, as all of you know, that, that really has changed. And part of what I'm interested in are the ways that we can aggregate capital and have many people participating in uh, investing for impact in ways that they weren't able to before. I was involved in the divestment movement against apartheid a long time ago. And so I'm really a believer in the possibility of the vocal power, people coming together to kind of influence financial muscle for social impact. So this slide, some of you may have seen this. Um, this is a slide that I borrowed from Rockefeller, who borrowed it from the Heron Foundation. Um, but, and the, the piece in the middle you can't see says cash, but um, this just shows the spectrum that, uh, philanthropists and impact investors are considering when they're looking at how, how they can deploy their money for uh, impact. And I worked for a while at a Fortune 100 company working on giving millions of dollars away and product away, and that was really exciting. But now I mostly work with small donors. I really like working with individuals and foundations, help them be creative about their giving. And the largest fund I work with gives away $5 million a year. So if we were just working on the philanthropic side, we would be missing out on all of the other tools in the toolkit. And so we really need to think creatively about the rest of that spectrum. So I just want to mention this, um, this philanthropic fund, which, and give a couple of examples of aggregated capital. So it's a donor advised fund, which is, it, it looks like a private foundation, but it's housed at Impact Assets, which is a nonprofit that was spun off from the Calvert Foundation, for those of you who know uh, social impact investing. And I'm a huge advocate of donor advised funds. When I have clients come to me and they haven't set up a foundation yet, I strongly encourage them to look at donor advised funds because you get a preferential tax treatment. You can do some of your giving anonymously if you choose. Um, it's much easier from a tax uh, reporting standpoint because the DAF handles all of that on its own and the fees are less. Um, so Impact Assets also has been very creative in putting impact investments up on what they consider their platform, making them available to all the donor advised fund holders. So it's a way of getting around investment minimums. There's something called village capital, which is uh, supports very early stage social enterprises and they're on this Impact Assets platform and so you can, if you have a donor advised fund at Impact Assets, which you could open with $5,000, then you could invest in these very early stage social enterprises for I think it's a $2,500 minimum or $5,000 minimum. Whereas usually to get into some of these funds, I don't know what Rune's minimum is, but it's you know 250,000 or something like that. So it's a way of making impact investing more accessible to um, smaller donors. Um, another aggregator, which I'll talk about in a, in a different kind of uh, form, is community foundations. And they also have donor advised funds, but they're coming up with ways to bring together um, donors around certain issues. So I just wanted to give an example of one of the things that Propel, Propel Capital has invested in one of our social enterprise projects. 
There is a social enterprise called Digital Divide Data, which does impact outsourcing. So they digitize old periodicals, or they tag videos, or they remove background from e-commerce photographs. Um, tedious work, but work that can be done with varying levels of, of uh, education degrees. And they work in Cambodia, Kenya, and now they have a project in the United States. But they, um, they cover 75% of their uh, costs of doing social impact with their revenue. And they provide scholarships and educational opportunities for hard to employ uh, people that are doing these digitization services. So they work with a lot of people in Cambodia who are disabled or urban um, slum dwelling youth, or they have a higher rate of employing women in Cambodia and Kenya than other places. And they have $12 million in revenue, and they are one of the top 100 outsourcing firms. So for five years, we've given them general operating support. <coughs> And I'm also a huge fan on the philanthropy side of general operating support. That's how private sector folks raise money. And that's they then have a senior management team that figures out how to deploy that. And it's not earmarked in all the different ways that philanthropic capital often is. So that's just a plug for general operating support. <clears throat> but we've also then done equity investments with them. They had a, uh, one of their board members who had been involved in starting the organization decided to create a for-profit company called Stat DNA that, did, that does video tagging of sports games. So if you're Mike Krzyzewski and you want to know that <coughs> Wisconsin are, always does certain kind of rebounds, then they, they go through all the video footage of the game and they tag certain things and analyze it. And it turned out to be a very good business proposition, because we invested $100,000 in it. All the work was done in Cambodia by the social enterprise. <clears throat> and then it turns out one of the European soccer clubs really liked this service and bought the company. And so we got a return of $250,000 on that investment. And the social entrepreneur who founded DDD immediately called us the day after we got the, the check for the return and said, well, I have another uh, possibility for you to invest it <coughs> in something with DDD. And that's a social enterprise B Corp called Liberty Source, which is a for-profit, wholly owned for-profit subsidiary of this nonprofit um, DDD entity. And that is a partnership with AOL to bring back jobs that they had outsourced to India to do back office accounting. And they want um, they wanted to bring them back to the United States and have military spouses who have a higher than average unemployment rate to have to be trained in these jobs. <clears throat> so we uh, made a hundred thousand dollar loan to Liberty Source, and there were others. Um, RSF Social Finance is another investor in the space that you may have heard of. And they had a bunch of investors who wanted to come in, but they didn't want to take on the same level of risk that we were willing to do. So we took the first loss position of 100,000, and then they were able to raise several times that because of the way we structured the deal. So it's just an example of the kind of, <clears throat> if you think about that whole spectrum, the kind of tools that we've used to help this organization when we, we don't have Gates level funding, but we're very flexible and we're willing to, to take on some more of the risk. So then the last thing I wanted to just say, because I was asked partly because I'm a board member of the Brooklyn Community Foundation to, to be here and you all have your very own new community foundation here. <coughs> um, they're not doing impact investing and they're not a social enterprise, though they are very enterprising. <laughs> um, but the, it is in a way that you're bringing together uh, different kinds of capital and having access because of the way you're coming together. They're doing a project <clears throat> around youth justice and trying to keep young people out of the prison system since even just one arrest has enormous social and economic costs. And we're bringing together a bunch of funders to be part of a collaborative, and they would never have, they're working with the mayor's office or the senior advisors for the mayor on this initiative, and they would never have that access if they hadn't come together 
the smaller donors and uh, be part of an aggregated community that the Community Foundation is doing. So I think there are ways, other ways outside of, um, of some of the investment piece that give, give opportunity for people to come together around the issues that they care about. <coughs> I'll look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. <laughs> I'll let you do that. So we, we are going to save some time for Q&A with the audience, but um, I, I want to get a little discussion going among the panelists <coughs> and some of the um, things that I heard and wanted to kind of drill down further on. One of the first was, you know, you, you all talked about the different ways that organizations with whom you are involved um, help to fund social enterprises. And I'm wondering if it's almost a life cycle discussion, you know, kind of a, a little bit, um, you mentioned this, you know, from the point of an idea germinating with a social entrepreneur to something like, you know, providing that, you know, growth bridge to a potential exit with a sale, right? Is, is there a, a different place to look for funding depending where you are in your, in your life cycle as a social enterprise, or is it less linear than that with people? Anyone? <laughs> uh, well, I would just, I'm, again, I'm sorry, Rashid's not here because um, the social entrepreneurs fund that he uh, manages is, we're in fund two, and they're in the process with fund one of trying to think about some exits. Um, and also because through Propel, we've been doing this for um, a while, and so we now have we now have some funds that we've been invested in for five plus years that are trying to do exits. And I feel like we could have a whole panel on the exit piece and how complicated it is because I, there's it's so exciting to fund the new social entrepreneur that has the great idea and so much potential, and it's really complicated figuring out the exit that ensures social impact and uh, has some financial return if that's part of the goal. And so I think, I mean, I could give some examples around that. There's a, there's a, um, a chocolate, a fair trade chocolate company, which we should come back to my topic of choice, um, called Alter Eco, and you should all eat their quinoa chocolate bar. It's so <laughs> delicious. All the salted butter was really good too. But, um, and they're part of, um, something called Good Capital, which is a, a, a fund that had, I think, five or six companies in it to start. It was one of the first funds uh, around social impact, founded by the same person who did Impact Assets and SOCAP, if, if you all know that uh, conference in San Francisco. But they're, they're too small to be bought by Hershey, this fair trade company. He's doing very well, but they're too small to be bought by the big chocolate companies. And they also, if they did, they might really have to give up some of their mission. But this fund is, is over. It's been around for seven years and everybody, all the investors are ready to get out, but there's not a clear exit for, so we've extended the fund for a year. We're hoping they'll get big enough that they'll be bought. And it's just, it's just more complicated than it seems when you're really excited at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. It's probably also a question of, um, well, two questions, so two, two, two metrics when you think about the appropriate capital that a, an entrepreneur would want is what their objective is, and then also where they are in that life cycle of meeting that objective. So I spoke to an entrepreneur the other day, and um, it's called Pen Pals, and they put together uh, students around the world with students in the U.S., and they talk about different topics, and it's... I was talking to my wife the other day, and she's like, you know, I, I, there's no pen pals anymore. And then right. a week later, this guy was telling me they're doing digital and online pen paling. And so we were talking, and, and the company is scaling rapidly. They have a lot of users. And he's like, well, I'm never interested. I'm, I'm not interested in selling. I was like, well, why are you talking to me? Because I'm not, I mean, I love your business, but there's no way we would ever invest in you because our bosses, our investors, have we have a limited life fund. They want liquidity. So our hands are tied. I mean, I love the business, but it's not right. So his objectives were very different that made him in, us inappropriate for him. Mm -hmm. um, or if you want to be a nonprofit, then it's inappropriate for us. If you want to be a for-profit that meets sort of our, our kind of time horizon and our financial returns, um, then that's a fit. So I think it's an objective. And then where you are in the life cycle, at least for us, you know, life cycle we typically see is a convertible note when you're early or stage, and then you get into the equity, and then you get into the debt. 
Um, and that's usually the typical life cycle. I think it's interesting, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's sort of these more um, uh, traditional forms of uh, financing in place. And I, I love to see these ones that are innovative. So there's, um, there was a woman who's an angel investor who did this sort of pay it forward angel investing, where she would invest in social entrepreneurs. I don't know if you've ever met her, but um, she's based in New York, Amy something or another. She wears very colorful hats. But she will invest in social entrepreneurs and uh, structure it such that any proceeds of that investment, uh, the entrepreneur with whom she invested and herself will then figure out that they will invest that in the future uh, in a, another social entrepreneur in the future. I don't know how legally you structure that, but that's not, I'm not, I'm not the lawyer, but, but that, is, that was the mechanism that she did, which I thought was quite innovative. Another was um, a woman named Diana Proper has this fund, it's sort of this evergreen fund for, for companies uh, like the one you were mentioning where they get some scale, but they don't want to exit, or this guy from Pen Pals where he doesn't want to exit, he wants to own the business, he never wants to sell. So what they'll do is they'll invest in more mature companies with no exit time horizon, but they'll take dividends, right? They'll take dividends, more sort of traditional, more mature businesses typically. Um, so anyway, I mean, those were two that, that struck me as quite innovative. Um, and legally, I think there's probably some uh, innovative, creative things you can do to, in order to structure them appropriately and provide coverage for investors and all, um, which is beyond my pay grade. But, um, but I, I mentioned them just because I thought they were innovative. Can I, can I ask a question? But so the pen pal um, founder, what is his business plan? He thinks he can generate enough revenue. I, yeah, that's yeah. right. And he's actually raised money from um, angel investors. And I said to him, well, what, like, you know, th don't they have an exit? And he said, well, we're thinking about an e-swap. Maybe we'll do a buyback at some point. The company will do a buyback of those shares at a fair market value. I was like, okay, that sounds interesting. Again, not for us, but, you know, maybe you find and individual investors definitely have far more leeway to do whatever it is that they want to do, whereas an institutional investor like SJF, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit more rigid. Or we're sort of boxed in a little bit more because of the, um, because of the, you know, the mandate and the needs of our investors. I think this discussion really um, demonstrates how funding a social enterprise is not just about getting capital into the enterprise. It's really the heart of doing the matching, right? So if you want a social enterprise to succeed, it's, it's my belief that a, a very core to that is matching up the entrepreneur with the right investor, right? Because they, they don't have this easy, you know, we just want it all to be about the financial return, everything is the bottom line, we can all easily align around that focal point. They have to be, you know, m much more um, certain of each other's commitments and where the balance is in that organization. It seems to me, and a lot of my work with Professor Dean talks about how the financing structure that you choose, and even that you choose at any moment in the life cycle of one of these companies, can be a way to identify the investors and the entrepreneurs who are on the same page, right? So you would pass on the pen pals because what they want in terms of you know, retention of ownership, control, mission, um, the balance of mission versus financial return doesn't work right for your investors. But someone else, the evergreen fund, someone who might, might structure a, a structured exit with redemption or something like that would be more willing. You know, so that's the right match to make for that social enterprise. So it's less of a, you know, who has money, right? <laughs> you know, um, and more about making the match. And I think traditional philanthropy you know, sophisticated players in the traditional ph philanthropy area know that to be a true as well, right? It's very tempting to just take the money of who, whomever may be offering it, right? But if you want to move the mission of your nonprofit forward, you also have to be mindful about, I need my, you know, my strategic team to be able to make decisions about how to deploy assets. I can't have everything earmarked for what an individual donor might want. I can't take my, you know, nonprofit too far off its mission by accepting a big grant in an area that we don't you know, plan to pursue. So I think it's actually a place where there's a lot of overlap between what social enterprises and nonprofits have to deal with, kind of those challenges. I would, I would also complement that by saying it's not only about uh, intentional and thoughtful matchmaking, but then also better understanding the marketplace of, of different capital and the spectrum. So SJF, again, is on one end of the spectrum and they, they take more of a traditional um, investment perspective perhaps. Um, with their commercial investors. Then you have other kinds of commercial investors who may have different goals, different timelines, different horizons. Then you have philanthropy, foundations, 
with different goals as well, and then traditional other kinds of grant providers. So trying to figure out though, as a startup social entrepreneur, um, what is that marketplace? Who are in each of these different categories on the spectrum? And I think that's unclear too, um, because I go back to the um, pioneer gap that Acumen Fund um, coined, and basically Acumen Fund is based here in New York, it's a social venture fund. And they talk about the pioneer gap problem of impact investing. And what that means essentially is there's this intense focus on scale. And so getting social entrepreneurs to create social enterprises to the point where they're ready to scale. And then that's when investment capital is ready to come in. But what happens on all the early stages to get them to that point, namely the startup phase, the uh, blueprint, the uh, validate, and then the prepare stages right before you get to scale, who's funding the early stages, and then who's funding the social enterprises focused on serving the poor? So there's not necessarily going to be um, huge promises of return. There could be some kind of return, but not certainly 20% um, you know, and above. So there, there's that issue too of just kind of funding the pipeline and mm -hmm. funding the ecosystem of social enterprises that can then get to a point that are uh, investment ready. So interesting. Well, I have a lot more questions, but I'm, I'm sure the folks in the audience, too, and I want to have time for that. So let's see who has questions out there. Um, right down in front. Um, we're a nonprofit. Hi. Um, Liz Gaines from, um, from a nonprofit that's been developing enterprises. And one of the um, where they are for profit under us. Um, but I found we found and we we're so blessed to have pro bono work from some of the best law firms in the city. But at the end of the day, it's been our accountants that have been um, helping us structure this. And so I'm, I'm wondering where, uh, the, in terms of the legal stuff, where that has come in because the law firms continue to come back to us and say, well, you need to talk to your accountants about that. And so I, I've noticed in terms of these kinds of different structures where sort of for lawyers and law students looking in this, how, how you make that bridge to what, at least in, so that every other minute is like, well, you could be jeopardizing your nonprofit status if you do this this way. Um, and a lot of what we're getting are sort of loans that are, I don't even under, you know, understand. And so part of it is also how you get people like me who have no grasp of finance, but have managed to build a $23 million nonprofit um, where our goal for our social enterprises is jobs for people who've been in prison. And that's kind of what runs us. So I'm sort of curious about how we also can educate folks like us to be able to think differently and how you kind of match those things up and also how accountants play in with lawyers to be able to create these new structures. Well, I have one, one suggestion that comes to mind and it has to do with the the tie into the second panel. Um, the Rikers Island SIB, the social impact bond, is, that's, are you with Osborne or, or perfect, perfect. So, um, I mean, I think that is, that, that, that's been very helpful in terms of understanding the, so as you know better than, than most of us here, the challenge was first getting the government, the New York City government to identify mm -hmm. the, co the actual cost involved so that they could then estimate the savings that they could get. So I think, for nonprofits wanting to do that, if you can't sell a direct service or good yourself, um, then perhaps there's another way that you are saving an entity money, um, whether it's a government or some other organization. So I think we need more um, analysis to help identify the direct connection to the service that a nonprofit could be providing for, that in terms of helping some entity save cost. That way then you can attract financing for the nonprofit um, hence the whole you know, the social impact bond that led to financing for your organization. But that wouldn't have happened but for an analysis of cost for the city of, of New York and then the actual cost savings that were projected. So we need more of that kind of analysis for different areas. Recidivism, it lends itself well to doing that. What about for you know, homelessness, early childhood development and so forth? Then there's also the second piece for impact measurement and that's the cost benefit analysis. So beyond taxpayer money saved per bed uh, decrease, per, per bed days decrease, um, it's, it's what about the additional outcomes? Um, 
that, that perhaps are advantageous to society. So the number of uh, uh, youth not returning to prison, but then contributing positively to society, what are the costs associated with that? How can we build that into financing for organizations like yourself? So I think we need more analysis done <coughs> in that regard. And that's not exclusively a legal thing or an accounting thing. That's more uh, business strategy, perhaps, um, uh, smarter people than, than me who need to get involved in that, that piece of it. I have a comment that's slightly off of what you're saying. But, and I would just say Liz is one of the most entrepreneurial social entrepreneurs <laughs> in the world in terms of what she's done with Osborne. But, um, I think, and you and I have talked about this, I think it is a challenge for nonprofits to figure out how to get on the, this bandwagon of social enterprise. Obviously, there are lots of nonprofits, as Michael right. spoke about, and that have been doing earned revenue you know, for a long, long time. But figuring out how to structure that is really complicated. And I think that some of the, we fund Echoing Green, and Ashoka does great work but figuring out how some of the new startups who have great ideas can go launch some of them within existing nonprofit organizations and help bring some of that expertise, whether it's accounting or business development or whatever, inside these other organizations. But I don't know how to address the accounting issue. I know just for this one example, DVD, they, they had so many discussions about if they have, you know, what if, if that DNA makes a ton of money. Could they have? Could some of the senior management of DVD have equity ownership in it? And you know, all these things about compensation that become complicated. Um, those are, I mean, a lot of people are writing about it, but those are really key issues. Other questions um, here in the the lady right there on your on your left in the oh here okay that's fine. Thank you. Well, thank you. This is directed to uh, Miss Williams. Uh, see that the New York Times this week, and of course as well as the, uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal had indicated uh, and announced that the prisoners in our system uh, need more education for their future use. And I see, according to your bio, you're involved with the Center of Prison Education. Uh, is anything special you want to comment as to what may be happening there? Well, Liz is probably the, the better person to speak to that. The Center for Prison Education is a, is a, um, a project that supports higher education uh, in prisons. That's through Wesleyan University, and then there's one at Bard that um, has funding from the Soros Foundation to support a lot of different higher education initiatives. And the Vera Institute is working with funding from Gates and Ford to launch programs in, I think, five or six states. Um, there used to be, I mean, we could have a longer conversation about this, but uh, when Clinton was president, he eliminated the Pell Grant funding, which was uh, higher education funding for prisoners. And so since then, there's been this hodgepodge, if there's anything, of higher education opportunities in prison. And now I think because there's more conversation about what's happening with mass incarceration, there's more interest in thinking about higher education programs. So I'm glad the Times and other places are writing about it. But Liz, I don't know if there's any, it's slightly off topic, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that. Why don't we try to get in one more question, maybe you can follow okay. up uh, at the break, yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Mary Rowe from um, Q, which is a Committee on Urban Entrepreneurship at MAS. And I have a slightly uh, tangential question for the three of you as financiers. Um, you know, location, 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 is an essential part of operating a business, whether it's for-profit or not-for-profit. And one of the challenges that we have in New York, as in other big global cities, is that space is just at such a premium that the, you can't afford to actually operate in a commercial space. So that chocolate company is fabulous, but can they locate themselves and be in the ecosystem, the entrepreneurial ecosystem that New York operate in? And I'm wondering if in your travels, are you finding anyone looking at alternate financing schemes to make space affordable and, to, and, and in, in turn then anchor uh, social enterprises, either for profit or not for profit, in neighborhoods. Is anybody thinking about that? Do you want to help? Do you guys want to um, Well, there is something called, um, it was started by the same person who started Impact Assets and the 
chocolate fund and so cap he also started something called the hub which is shared workspace i don't know if you yeah and so they do they also have hub ventures which is on the impact assets platform so there's financing for some of those um i mean and then and then a bunch of other um organizations that we fund use the we work space yeah. or the social innovation space here in new york so i don't know if that's i mean you, you're familiar with it right? What we're interested in is, is what's happening on streets, basically. And how do we, because we don't think that you can always oh, retail, aggregate that. Yeah. Well, retail or, and then uh -huh. second, third, and fourth stories, where traditionally yeah. we've had in New York City, all five boroughs, all sorts of economic and social good activity going on. And it's very difficult for those folks to hang on. So you can see what I mean. There, yeah, isn't, yeah. Really, there isn't really a financing mechanism for us to figure this out. I, yeah. Unless you guys know of one. That's what we're banging on. Well, okay. I was maybe Paul, I was gonna mention the Brooklyn Navy Yard just which is, you know, there are certain places in urban areas where they have in that received a lot of financing from the Bloomberg administration to make that a place that was affordable for people. I mean, that has a manufacturing and tech innovation hub angle, but um, I think that is a challenging issue. And I would just mention that uh, one of the things I do in my sort of the extracurricular side of my uh, tenure here at Brooklyn Law School is uh, attend meetings of the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Uh, and I know that in Downtown Brooklyn, one of the things that the partnership is thinking about is how to activate those second and third uh, stories, which are uh, above the, the retail and are, are sitting there. Uh, so your idea of somehow tying this into social enterprise uh, ventures uh, is one that I will certainly pass along and you may want to think about uh, being in contact with the, with the partnership. So with that, I want to thank Dana and our panelists. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, my takeaways here, there are, are many, but I'm thinking of uh, Arun's application of analytics to uh, a variety of different areas, including student financial decisions. Um, I love uh, Jonathan's uh, mention of empathy. Uh, one of the things that I say to the students in my class is that of the many qualities that uh, a lawyer should have high on that list should be empathy, the ability to understand uh, a whole range of uh, uh, of, of approaches to, to problems. Uh, Sarah, your focus on aggregation, I think, is critical uh, for this. Uh, and all of you were really talking about uh, how do you match resources and goals because uh, when we're talking about financial uh, objectives and mission objectives, uh, getting those two things to be in sync uh, is really critical and I appreciate uh, all of your discussion of, of, of that challenge. Uh, we're going to take a, a short break. Please plan to be back here in 15 minutes uh, for our second panel. Thank you.